you know, there is a, there is a right way and there's a wrong way to give the gospel. You know, there's, a, there's a right way and there's a wrong way to give the gospel. Um, Proverbs 15.1 says, A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. The tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright, but the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. So there is a right way to speak to somebody and there's a wrong way to speak to somebody. You speak to somebody the right way, it turns away wrath. You speak to somebody the wrong way, grievous words, it's actually going to make them angry. And the Bible says here that if you're wise, the tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright. So a wise man is not just somebody that knows knowledge and just throws it out however, you know, let the chips fall where they may, in that sort of sense. You know, you don't just, it's not just, oh, I'm just telling them the truth and they just have to deal with it. No, the Bible does not tell us at all to talk like that to people. It says the tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright. There's a right way to use knowledge and there's a wrong way to use knowledge. But the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. So a fool doesn't control his mouth. Words just pour out and um, they don't care how it affects the other person. Now, you know, you cannot always control what the other person thinks. I don't always, I'm not saying that the blame is totally on the person that's doing the offending because... It takes two to tango, right? Somebody has to be offended in order for those words to be offensive. So sometimes you will do your best to not be uh, offensive, but the person's still going to get angry. But what I'm saying is, you know, as children of God, as, as, as representatives of Christ, we should always have the mentality that we are striving not to upset people, even though, you know, sometimes when we speak, when we speak peace, they are for war. Um, let's look at Philippians. Philippians 1. Verse 15 says here, Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. So there's two types of people preaching the gospel two ways. They preach Christ of envy and strife, some of goodwill. The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add afflictions to my bonds. So what do we see there? One type of Christian is preaching Christ to get into a fight. They're not sincere about their motive, about why they actually are trying to explain the gospel to somebody. Supposing to add affliction to my bonds, you know, in, in terms of what Paul is saying, because he's in jail and it's adding you know, trouble to the fact that he's already in jail. But what I get from that is, you know, if you preach the gospel the wrong way, with the wrong motive, um, not sincerely, and you're trying to be contentious, then you're going to make it harder for other Christians, aren't you? You're going to add afflictions to bonds. He says, but the other of love. And remember what we talked about last week, the right reasons to preach the gospel. It's out of love. It's of goodwill, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then? Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. So, you know, I'm not upset at anybody, or, and I don't think anyone is doing this at all. So I'm not preaching this because people, I think anyone's doing it. But I know it's out there. And, and, you know, that's the frame of mind we should have. Like Paul said, hey, you know, whether it's preached the wrong way or whether it's preached the right way, I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. So he's still happy that the gospel is getting out there, but that doesn't mean that it's all right to do it the wrong way. We want to strive to do it the right way. Uh, 2 Corinthians 10. We'll see here. Just So basically what I'm talking about now is, you know, the, the way in which we should talk to people when we go soul winning. Uh, look at what's written here in 2 Corinthians 10. Now I, Paul, bes myself beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. So you see, when Paul, when Paul tr tried to exhort and to, and to encourage the believers at Corinth, he didn't come across harsh, did he? He didn't come across offensive. It says here, I, Paul, myself beseech you by the meekness and the gentleness of Christ. So it gives you an idea of how he came across to these people. I mean, he was very firm because we know the things that are written in 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. So he was very firm in what he said, but we also get a glimpse into how he approached these people. Um, who in presence and base among you. So he says, when I'm with you, I'm humble, I'm base, but being absent and bold toward you. But I beseech you that I may, that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence. So he's saying that, you know, I don't want to be that guy when I come that nobody likes and be bold. Uh, wherewith I think to be bold against some. So there are some that I got to be like that with, which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. 
For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. So there again, we, we're in a spiritual battle. We're not in a, a physical battle. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted it, itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So we see there that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're spiritual. They, they take captive people's thoughts and every imagination, every high thing that exalted the, itself against the knowledge of God. So we're in this battle of the mind. We're in this battle of words. And the point I just want to make here is, you know, if we're in a spiritual fight, then we ought to use spiritual weapons. So if we're not in a carnal fight, we shouldn't use carnal weapons. So in a spiritual fight, don't use carnal weapons. So what are our spiritual weapons? Well, we read in Ephesians 6, it's the Word of God. We use the Word of God. We use, uh, we, we, we saw prayer, um, you know, the fruit of the Spirit. You know, these are some examples of spiritual weapons. Uh, one thing that a, a bishop in Perth taught me was, you know, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace. So when you go soul winning, you go with love, right? You share with joy and you leave with peace. So that was one thing that he always said. You know, when you go soul winning, share with, you, you go with love, you, sh you share with joy, make sure you leave with peace. Um, I thought that was some really good advice. You know, what are some unspiritual weapons? You know, the works of the flesh, and we're going to go into some of these now, but, you know, the works of the flesh, you know, pride, you know, boasting, you know, being condescending, uh, without understanding is, 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 a, is a sin of the flesh. Um, not having understanding, that's why we shouldn't be ignorant about things. You know, strife. Now, you know, I'm all for debate, I'm all for discussion, but there's a point, and I think you guys all know, when a discussion becomes contentious, it becomes strife. You can disagree without being contentious. Um, and we should strive as much to, to not have strife, not be angry. You know, there's nothing to get angry about when we're, when we're preaching the gospel to people. If we're getting angry, then it just means we're getting proud, isn't it? And frowardness. Frowardness is a, is a work of the flesh. So, you know, it's, it's being, uh, you know, too full on with people and, uh, and not being subtle like we talked about. Um, let's look at Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4 verse 29. The Bible says here, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is, the, which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. So we see there that how we talk is very important. We want talk that builds people up. And we get, a, we get an idea here that the building up, we, we build up by ministering grace unto the hearers. We're gentle in that, you know, that meek and, um, you know, the meekness and gentleness of Christ, as Paul uh, mentioned in a previous verse we looked at. Um, let's look at Proverbs 15. I think I might have already actually gone here. I might have this twice in my... Yeah, I already, already went to that one. So we want to see here, let's go to James. James chapter 4, verse 6. And these are all familiar verses to us, but just to remind us of how the frame of mind we should have when we go soul winning. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Now, this is not the only time we see this. We see this in 1 Peter 5 as well. In verse 5, it says, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Now, I don't know if you guys realize this, but this is actually uh, a quote from the Old Testament. In Proverbs 3.34, that's why it says, For he saith, it is written. I always wondered where it was in the Old Testament, so I went to look for it, and I'm pretty sure it's this verse, Proverbs 3.34, Surely he scorneth the scorners, but he giveth grace unto the lowly. So there's that, God resisteth the proud, but he giveth grace to the humble. Now one thing if you notice about Peter, what's the context there? Is it unbelievers or believers? Believers, isn't it? And same with James. I guess he's addressing believers, isn't he? He's, he's addressing, um, you know, people that aren't doing the right thing. 
But you know, whenever we think of that verse, God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble, when we think about it in something, we always apply it to the unbeliever, don't we? We say, if they're too proud to, res to, to accept God's grace, God is resisting them because they're proud. They're not humble enough to ex receive the grace of God, receive salvation. But these verses are always in the context of believers. And not that I don't think it doesn't apply to unbelievers, but you know, maybe they're in the context of believers because it's more important that we're not proud than it is for the person who's hearing us to be proud. You know, yes, is God going to resist them if they're proud? Yes. But I don't want God resisting me. You know, when I go out and I give the gospel and I'm talking to people, I don't want to have pride because I don't want the Spirit of God resisting me. I want God to give me grace. I need to be humble so that God will use me to preach to other people. So I thought that was a good point there. Let's look at James uh, 1, 19. Another tip for soul winning. It says here, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. So when we go out there and we talk to people, you know, make sure that you're listening to them. You know, don't cut them off all the time. And you know, I'm not saying that I'm perfect. I mean, for those of you who are going solving with me, I'm sure I've broken every single one of these rules. But, you know, this is what we should be striving for. You know, when we talk to people, you know, that we are swift to hear. When they want to uh, express an objection or they want to express an opinion, let's listen to them. And, you know, that's going to be, make you more effective as well when, you, when you're going soul winning because if you know what they believe, you can tie that into what you're going to say to them. So let every man be swift to hear, quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. So, you know, think about what you're going to say and, and don't get angry for the wrath of God worketh not the righteousness of God. Uh, Colossians 4, look at this verse, it says here, <clears throat> Continue in prayer, verse 2, and watch in the same with thanksgiving, with all praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds. So we should be praying that God will use us, that God will give us the words to speak. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Now, here's what I wanted to point, point out to you. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. Now, I think us that are amongst independent Baptist churches, fundamental churches, you know, we have come, we, we have this frame of mind that it's just, this is the truth, accept it or reject it, and we come across with a lot of salt, right? We have a lot of salt in our speech. But how does the Bible say we're meant to talk? Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt. So there's nothing wrong with the truth, but it seems like it's saying here that, you know, the, the, the hard truths that are, are more salty, you have to put just a little bit on there so it's easier for that person to digest that spiritual food. I mean, if we're going to make hamburgers later on, and you know the, the, the patties are like 99% salt and 1% meat. <laughs> it's not going to be a very pleasant patty. You probably aren't going to be eating it. So we don't want our soul winning to be like that. We don't want our soul winning to be 99% salt and 1% grace. We want it to be always with grace, seasoned with salt. And it's just interesting that he says here, that you may know how or in what way you ought to answer every man. So this is how we should be talking to people, grace seasoned with salt. I'm all for the truth, but you know, we have to be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. And, and God is giving us, I believe, some, some tips here on how we ought to talk to people. And I just want to drum this in a bit further. We see here in, in uh, 1 Timothy 2, verse 24. Now obviously this is a charge to bishops and deacons, leaders of churches, but, you know, we are all a servant of God in, in, in one sense or another. And we all should be striving for that same, that same standard. It says here in verse 24 in 2 Timothy 2, The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. So when you read these verses that we've been going through, do you see somebody that's just harsh with somebody? That's just, you know, this is how it is, whether you like it or not. No, you see, you see the gentleness, you see the meekness, you see the patience there. In, in meekness instructing those 
that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them the uh, repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. 1 Peter 3, this is a very famous verse when it comes to apologetics made famous by answers in Genesis. It says here, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you. Right? And that's usually what people think about, right? Hey, I just need to have an answer for a reason of the hope that is in me. But look what it says, with meekness and fear. And if you actually read that whole chapter, it is talking about you know, having compassion, finally be you all in mind, having compassion one of another, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing. So it's, it's about how we deal with our relationships and how we talk to people. And just to finish this point here, Romans 12, verse 17. You know, the overarching principle that we could say here, it says here, recompense no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. So we see there, um, uh, you know, that we should not recompense evil for evil. We, as much as life in us, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, so he's saying, Because God will make things right, therefore if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink, for in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. So we see here the frame of mind we should have when we talk to people, when we want to do them good. If they do us evil, do we recompense with evil? No, we shouldn't. We, can, we should recompense with good.